During the first sessions of our seminar, we have talked about the various trains and schools of thought of IPE, as well as some of the theoretical approaches towards analyzing and understanding international political economy. We have seen a whole number of very well done and highly informative presentations and got a lot of valuable input that brought us closer to the important field of IPE. At this time, you did not only recognize how important, valuable and fascinating IPE is, both as an academic subject and also in the real world beyond the academic realm, and also that it can get fairly complex. Some of you signal to me that to even better understand the workings of IPE, it would be helpful for you to talk to you more about what political economy is in the first place before continuing with international political economy. So let us use the first online lecture today to do exactly this. Think about things such as the history, the nature, the context, and some aspects even of philosophy of political economy in order to add an additional basis to understanding IPE. Let us go back some time in history, then we will figure out that the question of how does politics affect economic outcomes probably has been asked as long as people have been interested in economics itself. When we look to the grand classics of the field, maybe such as Adam Smith, you know the gentleman who wrote the famous Wealth of Nations back in 1776, or John Stuart Mill, with his Principles of Political Economy, a book he published in 1848, we clearly can see that what we now call economics was then, back at those times, generally referred to as political economy. Why was that so? And why has this changed? The terminology used in earlier times in large part reflected the belief that economics was not really separable from politics. What does this mean exactly? It means that politics and economy were more than a mere administrative classification of academic disciplines. Rather, it reflects the widespread view that political factors are crucial in determining economic outcomes. In other words, as a discipline, economics historically viewed political forces not only as influencing economic outcomes, but often as determining influence. And of course, you just have to think of Eastern systems theory, also economy, the economy as a part of the context of political decision making can have quite a tremendous impact on policy formulation on behalf of the state decision makers. Only with the more recent academic division of economics and political science into distinct academic disciplines, economists began to abstract from political and institutional factors. Why did that happen? There are certainly a whole number of reasons, but one of the major reasons was that the pragmatic comprehensive perception was traded for the desire for methodological progress and the wish to obtain a more rigorous basis for economic analysis. We talked about that in class, about the models, about the economic models, about the inclination for quantitative studies and so on and so forth. So these factors may be regarded as important motivations in this separation process. So let's move to economics and the economy in the context of political economy. First of all, how do economics and the economy relate to each other? And is economics really enough to explain the economy? So what is eco economics? And how does it relate to what we just said before about the separation of political and economic sciences? Economics is a social science concerned with the production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services. The principle 
And the problem also of economics is that human beings have unlimited wants and occupy a world of limited means. For this reason the concepts of efficiency and productivity are held paramount by economists. Increased productivity and a more efficient use of resources, so the argument goes, could lead to a higher standard of living, for example. For this, economics study how individuals, businesses, governments and nations make choices on allocating resources to satisfy their wants and needs, trying to determine how these groups should organize and coordinate efforts to achieve maximum output. In this vein, economics can generally be broken down into macroeconomics, which concentrates on this behavior of the aggregate economy, and microeconomics, which focuses on individual consumers and businesses. We can go a little bit more in detail here. Microeconomics focuses on how individual consumers and firms make decisions. These individuals can be single persons, they can also be a household, meaning a family in the economic sense, a business or an organization, or also a government agency. Analyzing certain aspects of human behavior, microeconomics tries to explain, they respond to changes in price and why they demand what they do at particular price levels. Microeconomics tries to explain how and why different goods are valued differently, how individuals make financial decisions, and how individuals best trade, coordinate, and cooperate with one another. The topics of microeconomics range from the dynamics of supply and demand to the efficiency and cost associated with producing goods and services. They also include how labor is divided and allocated uncertainty, risk, and strategic game theory. Macroeconomics, on the other hand, studies an overall economy on both a national and international level. Its focus can include a distinct geographical region, for example, but also a country, a continent, or the whole world. Topics studied include foreign trade, government fiscal and monetary policy, unemployment rates, the level of inflation and interest rates, the growth of total production output as reflected by changes in the GDP, the gross domestic product, I will talk about that in a minute, and business cycles that result in expansions, booms, recessions, and maybe even depressions. Both micro and macro economics are intertwined. As economists gain an understanding of certain phenomena they can help us make more informed decisions when allocating resources. Many believe that microeconomics foundations of individuals and firms acting in aggregate constitute, finally, macroeconomic phenomena. Economics is especially concerned with efficiency in production and exchange and uses models and assumptions to understand how to create incentives and policies that will maximize efficiency. This takes us to some economic schools of thought. Two of the most common are monetarist and Keynesian. Monetarists have generally favorable views on free markets as the best way to allocate resources and argue that stable monetary policy is the best course for managing the economy. In contrast, the Keynesian approach believes that markets often do not work well at allocating resources on their own and favor fiscal policy by an activist government in order to manage irrational market swings and recessions. Economic analysis often progresses through deductive processes, including mathematical logic, where the implications of specific human activities are considered in a means and framework. Some branches of economic thought emphasize empiricism rather than formal logic, especially, especially macroeconomics or Marshallian microeconomics, which attempt to use the procedural observations and falsifiable tests associated with the natural sciences. 
Since true experiments, of course, cannot be created in economics, empirical economists rely on simplifying assumptions and retroactive data analysis. However, some economists argue economics is not well suited to empirical testing and that such methods often generate incorrect or inconsistent answers. But today we will not go too deeply into the issue of economic methodology because we are dealing with political economy and first of all we really want to understand what political economy is and how it uh, fits together or how politics and economics go together so we cannot de do the highly specific discussions of economics but what we heard should be enough based on the various scientific approaches economists formulate and publish numerous economic indicators such as for example the gdp or the computer com consumer price index the cpi and on that background we will now look uh, take a look a closer look into the indicators economic indicators are reports that deal a country's economic performance in a specific area these reports are usually published periodically by governmental agencies or private organizations and they often have a considerable effect on stocks on fixed income and forex markets when they are released they can also be very useful for investors to judge how economic conditions will move markets and to guide investment decisions now we will turn to some of the major indicators for fundamental analysis first of all i will briefly address the gdp the gross domestic product the GDP is considered by many to be the broadest measure of a country's economic performance. It represents the total market value of all finished goods and services produced in a country in a given year or another period. Many investors, analysts and traders don't actually focus on the final annual GDP report, but rather on the two reports issued a few months before. That would be the advanced GDP report and the preliminary report. This is because the final GDP figure is frequently considered a lagging indicator, meaning it can confirm a trend, but it can't predict a trend. In comparison to the stock market, the GDP report is somewhat similar to the income statement a public com company reports at the end. Nevertheless, for us or for political economy, particularly when taking the political science perspective, the GDP can be a very important indicator for assessing the country and comparing it to other countries with respect to many aspects political scientists are interested in. The retail sales indicator is also an, a very interesting indicator, particularly important also in the US, uh, where it is reported by the Department of Commerce during the middle of each month. It is very closely watched um, and it measures the total receipts um, or the currency value of uh, all merchandise sold in stores. The report estimates the total merchandise sold by taking example, a sample data from retailers across the country, a figure that serves a proxy of consumer spending levels. Because consumer spending levels represent more than two thirds of GDP, this report is very useful to guard the economy's general direction. Also because the report's data is based on the previous month sales, it is a timely indicator. The content in the retail sales report can cause above normal volatility in the market and information in the report can also be used to guard inflationary pressures that affect the rates of the central bank. Industrial production is another indicator also in the US for example released monthly by the Federal Reserve. There we get reports on the changes in the production of factories, mines and utilities. One of the closely watched measures included in this report is the capacity utilization ratio which estimates the portion of productive capacity that is being used rather than standing idle in the economy. 
It is preferable for a country to see increasing values of production and capacity utilization at high levels. Typically, capacity utilization in the range of 82 to 85 percent is considered tight and can increase the likelihood of price increases or supply shortages in the near term. Levels below 80 percent are usually interpreted as showing slack in the economy, which might increase the likelihood of a recession. Again, we can gather data, we get an information which is highly interesting and important for policymakers, uh, but also other actors within the socio-political and socio-economic sphere. The same applies to employment data. General sharp increases in employment indicate prosperous economic growth, like both potential contractions may be imminent if significant decreases occur. While these are general trends, it is important to consider the current position of the economy. For example, strong employment data could cause a currency to appreciate if the country has recently been through economic troubles because the growth could be a sign of economic health and recovery. Conversely, in an overheated economy, high employment can also lead to inflation, which is the situation, uh, sorry, in which in this situation could lead to the currency moving downward. Final index I would like to shed a brief light on is the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. It measures the level of retail price changes, the cost that consumers pay basically, and is the benchmark for measuring inflation. Using a basket that is representative of the goods and services in the economy, the CPI compares the price changes month after month and after the year. This report is one of the more important economic indicators available and it is released uh, and through its release can increase volatility in equity, fixed income and forex markets. Greater than expected price increases are considered a sign of inflation which will likely cause the underlying currency to depreciate. We will find that type of indicators in basically all uh, economies and all political economies and all states and all systems with different names maybe uh, with a little bit different setup but in general these are important key marks for the well-being of an economy and very important signals for political decision makers. The building blocks of economics are the studies of labor and trade. Since there are many possible applications of human labor and many different ways to acquire resources, it is difficult to determine which methods yield the best results. Economics demonstrate, for example, that it is more efficient for individuals or companies to specialize in specific types of labor and then trade for their own for their other needs or wants, rather than trying to produce everything they need or want on their own. It also demonstrates trade is most efficient when coordinated through a medium of exchange or money. Economics focuses on the actions of human beings. Most economic models are based on assumptions that humans act with rational behavior, seeking the most optimal level of benefit or utility. But of course, and we have talked about that, we found, about, oh, found out about that, human behavior can be very unpredictable or inconsistent, very much based on personal and sub subjective values. And that is also another reason why economic theories often are not well suited to empirical testing. This means that some economic models may be unattainable or impossible or just not work in real life. The notion of the rational actor has been adopted or no, it has been added by the notion of a bounded rationality. So that's not like the absolute rationality, but a rationality bounded by the individual experiences and the implications of these. So the socialization effects, perception effects, 
interpretation effects and so on and so forth. And that's quite striking that a Nobel Prize laureate who got it for economics basically is one of the leading experts in thinking about biases and so on. Nevertheless, those models still, or many models still do provide, uh, can if they are used correctly, provide key insights for understanding the behavior of financial markets, of governments, of economies as a whole, and of course, the always existing human decisions behind these entities. As it is, economic laws tend to be very general and formulated by studying human incentives. Economics can say profits incentivize new com competitors to enter a market, for example, or that taxes disincentivize spending. We also find different types of economic systems, and that, of course, is again highly a highly political aspect. Economic systems per se are defined either by the way that stuff is produced or by how that stuff is allocated to people. When we go further back, for example, in primitive agrarian societies, people tend to self-produce all of their needs and wants at the level of their household or tribe. Family members would build their own dwellings grow their own crops, hunt their own game, fashion their own clothes, bake their own bread, and so on. This self-sufficient economic system, as we call it, is defined by very little division of labor, which is something today we cannot find a lot. On the contrary, today we find a very high degree of division of labor, and not only within a country, but spread throughout the world, and that is also when the political economy issue is becoming an international political economy. Such a primitive society, which we are just describing, where there is little division of labor, everything is based on the reciprocal exchange with other family or tribe members and so on. The concept of private property, which is also crucial in today's economics, economic systems, particularly in the West, didn't typically exist as the needs of the community were produced by all for the sake of all. Nevertheless, even if we didn't have the concept of private property, it certainly is interesting to look into the governance, the leadership of those tribes. So we have to always to see what is the political leadership, what is the political system, what is the economic system, what is uh, leadership, what are the instruments, institutions, such as uh, private property, and how do politics and economics influence each other. Going back to our tribe and what happened later, we can say as civilizations developed, economies based on production by social class emerged, such as feudalism and slavery. Slavery involved production by enslaved individuals who lacked personal freedom or rights and existed as the property of their owner. Feudalism was a system where a class of nobility, known as lords, owned all the lands and leased out small parcels to peasants to farm, with peasants handling over much of their production to the lord. In return, the lord offered the peasants relatively safety and security including a place to live and food to eat. With the advent of industrialization, capitalism emerged. Capitalism is defined as a system of production whereby business owners, the so-called capitalists, produce goods for sale in order to make profit and not for personal consumption. In capitalism, capitalists own the business, including the tools used for production, as well as the finished product. Workers are hired in return for wages, and the worker owns neither the tools he uses in the production process, nor the finished product when it is complete. So, for example, if somebody works in a shoe factory, and this person wants to take home a pair of shoes at the end of the day, 
he cannot just take it even if he made it with his own hands because that would be regarded as stealing. It's the property of the owner of the factory, not of the people who is working and producing it. That is because capitalist economies rely on the concept of private property to distinguish who legally owns what. Capitalist production relies on the market for the allocation and distribution of the goods that are produced for sale. A market is a venue that brings together buyers and sellers and where prices are established that determine who gets what and how much of it. And of course, when we look around the world, it's particularly the United States and of course, to some lesser degrees, all of the states of what is called the developed world that can be de described as capitalist market economies. It still should be mentioned that alternatives to this type of capitalist productions exist. Two of the most significant ones developed in the 19th century as a response, a response to what was seen as capitalism's abuses. Socialism is a system of production whereby workers collectively own the business, the tools of production, the finished product and share the profits instead of having business owners who retain private ownership of all the businesses and simply hire workers in return for wages. Socialist production often does produce for profits and utilizes the market to distribute goods and services. Um, we can see that even within capitalist societies, for example, even in the United States, where worker co-ops are an example of a socialist type of production organized under a broader capitalist system. Communism then is a system of production where every pri where, where private property ceases to exist as a whole and the people of a society collectively own the tools of production. Communism also does not use a market system but instead relies on a central planner who organizes production. So basically uh, that's a state institution that tries to get the overall idea of what has to be produced and which numbers for whom, what is needed for each and any process uh, going on in the country and then tell the people who will work and what job. Distributes the goods and services to consumers based on assumed need. Sometimes that is therefore also called a command economy. With these um, ideas, with these basic informations about the economy or about economics in the back of our minds, we now can move on from economic systems to the political in the political economy. And actually, when we look closer, it's not only economic systems, but basically socioeconomic and socio political systems, because communism or capitalism is more than just the way of production and distribution. Raymond Williams suggested that when taking up a definition, one should start with basic social practices, not fully formed concepts. Called for example for an etymology based on social as well as intellectual history because the meaning of ideas is forged in concrete social practices. Offering a conceptual point of view now, a dictionary, a dictionary of economic terms tells us that political economy is the science of wealth and deals with efforts made by man to supply wants and satisfy desires. That's from a dictionary 1987. But following now William's socially grounded etymology, it is important to stress that before political economy became a science, before, if you want to put it that way, it uh, served as uh, the intellectual description for a system of production, distribution and exchange, political economy also meant the social custom, practice and knowledge about how to manage first the household and later the community. 
Specifically, the term economics is rooted in the classical Greek oikos for house and nomos for law. Hence, economics initially referred to household management, a view that persisted into the work of founding influences in uh, classical political economy. Scottish Enlightenment figures like Francis Hutchinson and, of course, Adam Smith, political derives from the Greek term polos, or the city-state, and fundamental unit of political organization in the classical period. Political economy, therefore, originated in the management of the family and political households. Writing 15 years before Smith, Wealth of Nations, Sturt made the connection by noting that what economy is in a family, political economy is in a state. And now we could also add international political economy is in the world. It is also important to note that from a very beginning Political economy combined a sense of the descriptive and the prescriptive. As communication scholar Della Smith describes its driving force or metapolitical economy, it is the body of practice and theory offered as advice by counselors to the leaders of social organizations of varying degrees of complexity at various times and places. This idea, of course, is in keeping with, for example, the Dictionary of Economic Terms, which defined the original intent of political economy as a branch of statecraft, but which is now regarded as a study in which moral judgments are made on particular issues. Other definitions we can find concentrate on how the development of economics narrowed what was originally a broadly based discipline. As early as 1913, a standard economic dictionary noted that although the name political economy is still preserved, the science is now understood, so now meaning a hundred years ago, as not strictly political. That means it is not confined to relations between the government and the governed, but deals primarily with the industrial activities of individual man. Similar, about half a century later, in 1948, the Dictionary of Modern Economics defined political economy as the theory and practice of economic affairs. When we look into that article, we can find that it noted that originally the term applied to broad problems of real cost, surplus and distribution. These questions were viewed as matters of social as well as individual concerns. With the introduction of utility concepts in the late 19th century, the emphasis shifted to changes in market values and questions of equilibrium of the individual firm. Such problems no longer required a broad social outlook and there was no need to stress the political. At least as maybe a little bit in surprise. But at the same time, there is evidence that the transition from political economy to economics was not inevitable. This same 1948 volume notes the beginnings already of a revival of interest in a more broadly defined political economy. It senses that the emphasis is once again returning to political economy with the recent rise of state concern for public welfare. This was echoed later in a standard book on economic terms, 1987. According to it, the combination of Marxist, who never abandoned the old terminology of political economy and by the 1960s, the radical libertarian right from Chicago and the Center for the Study of Public Choice at Virginia Polytechnic gave renewed life to this old discipline. 
One can think now about political economy as the study of the social relations, particularly the power relations that mutually constitute the production, distribution and consumption of resources. But political economy takes this even further because it asks us to concentrate on a specific set of social relations organized around power or the ability to control other people, processes and things even in the face of resistance. A far more general and ambitious definition of political economy is the study of control and survival in social life. Control refers specifically to the internal organization of individual and group members, while survival takes up the means by which they produce what is needed to reproduce themselves. Control processes are broadly political in that they involve the social organization of relationships within the community. Survival processes are fundamentally economic because they concern the production of what a society needs to reproduce itself. The strength of this definition is that it gives political economy the breadth to encompass at least all of human activity and arguably all organic processes. This is in keeping with the pattern of analysis in environmental, ecological and science studies which among other things aim to identify processes to work in all forms of life and to assess their differences and interrelationships. Definitions are useful, but they take us just so far. Another way to describe political economy is to focus on a set of central qualities that characterize the approach. These broaden the meaning of political economy beyond what is typically provided in definitions. Drawing on the work of Murdoch and Golding from 2005, among other scholars, this, uh, what I'm talking about now, focuses on four ideas at the cornerstone of political economy. Social change and history, the social totally, moral philosophy and praxis. Let's start with the first aspect. Political economy has traditionally given priority to understanding social change and historical transformation. For classical theorists like Adam Smith, David Ricardo, you already talked about him, and John Stuart Mill, this meant comprehending the great capitalist revolution, the upheaval that transformed societies based primarily on agricultural labor into commercial manufacturing and ultimately industrial societies. For political economists like Karl Marx, it meant examining the dynamic forces in capitalism responsible for its growth and change. The object was to identify both cyclical patterns of short-term expansion and contraction as well as long-term transformative patterns that signal fundamental change in the system. In his introduction to the 1923 edition of John Kells Ingram's influential History of Political Economy, Robert Eli explains the central role of history in the mind of the political economist. And it is worth to quote it, so that's why I will give you the quote in detail. Quote, it is now universally acknowledged that societies are subject to a process of development which is itself not arbitrary but regular and that no social fact can be really understood apart from its history. Hence, the pocket formulas in favor with the older school, which were supposed to suit all cases and solve all problems, have lost the esteem they once enjoyed, and economics has become historical in its method. The several stages of social evolution being recognized as having different features and requiring in practice, a modifying intervention which ought to vary from one stage to
to another. Unquote. Looking back over the development of economics, sound as it was, Eli's optimism about the triumph of history in the discipline was clearly misplaced. And again, we heard those triumphs when we think about the end of history, which was claimed to be come to have come after the end of the Cold War. Francis Fukuyama once came up with that notion, and we will come back to that. History would remain central to political economy, but the neoclassical synthesis, which became mainstream economics, set history aside, or at least kept it in the background. This was chiefly because history made all the more difficult the drive to turn economics into a science. Compare Eli's optimism with the view of Baron Sweezy, who after praising the historical sensibility of Adam Smith and his um, followers, attack contemporary economics. Quote, anti-historical to the core Present-day bourgeois economics scorns any effort to investigate the nature of the changes that are taking place or where they are leading. For Bell, the absence of a sense of time and history is part of the general crisis in economic theory. Quote again. And finally, economic theory has to return to time in the logical sense and to history in the empirical fact, in order to be responsive to the complex new social arrangements that derive from the widening of the scales and new arenas of economic and social actions." Unquote. One source of renewed interest in political economy is the drive to determine whether we are in the midst of an epochal transformation similar to the one that occupied the thinking of political economy's founding figures. People experience what appears to be profound social change and wonder whether they are witnessing a fundamental rearrangement of social structures and processes that reflect the turn to one or a combination of post-industrialism, post-modernism, post-Fordism, a network society, or instead a deepening and extension of fundamental tendencies at work since the earliest days of capitalism. The answer to this question is central to how we think about social change. And moreover, the question itself suggests a turn to the historical thinking that propelled the development of a political economy approach. I think that all reminds us of the thoughts we have and we are confronted with when we talk about the development of globalization, the effects of globalization, the issue if there is a new imperialism coming along with globalization, the question of value chains of new interdependencies and the value and dangers of interdependencies as we currently can see with production in China being affected, with the global trade chains being affected, and the dependencies on products from other continents. Political economy from the time of its founders has also maintained that the discipline should be firmly rooted in an analysis of the wider social totality. What does that mean again? This means that political economy spans the range of problems that today tend to be situated in the compartments of several academic disciplines where those with an interest in social class go to sociology, those interested in government, to political science. In the market, they go to economics, 
and so on and so forth. From the time of Adam Smith, with Wealth of Nations, you know disciplinary boundaries, political economy has been taken up with a mutual constitution and multiple determination of social life. Early in the development of political economy, Mill described the necessity of a broad approach to social life. For practical purposes, political economy is inseparably intertwined with many other branches of social philosophy. Except on matters of mere detail, there are perhaps no practical questions which admit being decided on economical premises alone." End quote. Like many political economists, Mill is interested in using political economy as one means of understanding the social whole, even while acknowledging that his own approach is interconnected with the other branches of what he calls social philosophy. From this perspective, political economy is not just another approach. It is also a guide to understanding the relationships that prevail among numerous approaches and to the relationships among many aspects of social life. Heilbronner, another scientist, put it in the 80s in the following words. The great economists were no mere intellectual fusspots. They took the whole world as their subject and portrayed that world in a dozen bold attitudes. Angry, desperate, also hopeful. This view prevailed for quite some time as the generally accepted goal of political economy. By 1923, even as the name was changed to economics, General texts continued to support this broad-based view of the political. Again, I would like to go back to Richard Eli, the guy who very optimistically uh, spoke before, and I quote him again, as the place of economics in the general system of the sciences, it holds that the study of wealth cannot be isolated, except temporarily and provisionally, from the other social phenomena that is essential to keep in view the connections and interactions of the several sides of human life. This concern for the social totality is reflected in otherwise fundamentally different approaches to political economy. The perspective often referred to as public choice theory Labels positive or constitutional political economy can also be found in that uh, respect when we talk about this approach. It takes its inspiration from the conservative wing of economic theory. Setting aside for the moment the assumptions and ideas that propel this view, this branch of political economy maintains that it can and ought to be applied to all forms of social behavior. According to Brennan Buchanan, public choice theory, or constitutional political economy, as it may be called as well, marks a return to the classical tradition that viewed economics as the study of how markets work, with markets understood so broadly as to encompass the coordination of individual behavior through the institutional structure meaning the institutional structure of society and the state as a whole. For those who advance this view, the subject of political economy is the study of the rules governing the connection between the individual and the institution. Such rules are constituted, they contend, out of the choices made by Homo economicus, the rational, self-oriented maximizer of contemporary economic theory. Hence, the entire social arena is the field of analysis for political economy. The choices that create rules governing markets in everything from the traditional private markets in goods and services to the markets for votes, for spouses, for children, for communication and so on, are its subject matter. One of its proponents defends this view as a necessary economic imperialism.
On the other side, from the conservatives, there is the political economy inspired by Marxian, socialist and institutionalist approaches. These differ from the public choice view on almost all points except this one. Notwithstanding variations among theorists, they approach political economy with an eye to understanding the social totality. That is, of course, what we expected now. This view is firmly rooted in the work of Marx and carries forward among Fabian scholars, socialists, Western Marxists, autonomists, theorists of underdevelopment, and institutionalists who trace their lineage to Commons, Veblen, Robinson, and Galbraith. These perspectives have clashed over most central points of political economic theory, but recognize and seek to account for in distinct ways the relationship between the economic and the political, as well as between these and the wider arena of sociocultural institutions and practices. First and foremost, a commitment to the social totality means understanding the connections between the political and the economic. In reaction to what were considered tendencies in Marxist theory to reduce everything to the economy, numerous works appeared in the 1970s and 80s that aimed to correct this by arguing for the relative autonomy of government vis-a-vis -vis the economy. Bob Jessup, for example, was arguing that way. This sparked a lively debate that revived interest in the growth of the state, its relationship to social class, gender and race, and called attention to the dynamic connection between the political and the economic and political economy. The ferment is likely to continue for some time. Nevertheless, the debate has always been about relative autonomy. Also, also the term relative autonomy is slippery and can get in the way of an informed exchange of views. None of the parties to the debate seriously called for separating political from economic analysis. Most recognized that the existing division of academic labor is seriously flawed because those who have the upper hand in determining its direction accept the formal separation of the political from the economic, the need to model economics after the physical sciences, and the view that economics can be rendered free from ideological biases by eliminating political content. Political economists who work in the institutionalist socialist or the Marxian tradition are also connected to, uh, sorry, to, uh, also concerned to identify the links between society's political economy and the wider social and cultural field. There, they draw very much on the work of Veblen. Institutional economists are interested in the relationship of acquisitiveness or greed and what he called conspicuous consumption or the drive for power and status, which, in their view, is fueled not by the rationality featured in mainstream economics, but deeply buried, but by deeply buried irrational drives. Inspired by Marxian theory, the writers of the French Regulation School look to identify the relationship between regimes of accumulation and associated model modes of social and political regulation which encompass but extend beyond the state. Their influence, however, began to wane in the 1990s, but, uh, 1990s, but theorists inspired by Marx and also by the Italian Marxist theorist of the early 20th century, Antonio Gramsci, continued to build a bridge between political economy and broader social and cultural forces. In addition to bringing the state back into our understanding of the economic, they called for closer links between culture and political economy. Sayer once put it in those words, I quote, one of the hallmarks and prime achievements of cultural political economy 
are the explorations of the embedded nature of economic activities, how they are set within social relations and cultural contexts that make a difference to those economic processes." Unquote. Additionally, in an effort to explain what they perceive to be transformations in the political economic order brought about by the decline of a mass production and mass uh, consumption economy organized around large national businesses, political economists argue for the need to think about a broad social, economic and cultural shift from a Fordist to a post-Fordist society built on the principle of flexible accumulation. Furthermore, world system theorists, and the most important one certainly there is Immanuel Wallerstein, reject the narrowness that constrains current social science research and call for reversing the tendencies that have, I quote, pushed us away from holistic and systematic realities toward the individual or its organizational equivalent, the firm, the family, the state, as the appropriate unit of analysis. Finally, theorists of the autonomous school argue for the political economy that examines social totality as a set of network connections between local and global conflicts, starting not from the power of capital, but from the struggles of what is called the multitude. That is particularly Hart and Negri who were arguing this way. This broadly based effort to examine the wider social totality does not receive complete intellectual support, however. For example, those aligned with streams of postmodernist and also uh, post-structuralist thinking reject sometimes emphatically the idea of a social totality. Across the range of differences within these views, one finds agreement that the term society is an attempt to apply a unity in discourse to something fundamentally divided, disconnected, and hence undefinable. The general tendency is to argue that there is no social totality, no individual totality, and no discursive totality. According to this view, the implosions of 20th century life, set off in part by the power of new communication and information technologies, have broken up those totalities taking with them measures of time and space that ultimately used to provide some degree of unity. We are left with the task of understanding the local, the fragmented, the parts of what used to be thought of as the elements in a wider whole, but which are in reality unconnected or loosely tied pieces. By removing the ideological glue of social unity, one can comprehend the real value of these pieces and ultimately celebrate them in their resistance to all totalizers, including capitalism, the state, and the producers of meta-narratives. So we can clearly see, in particular those of you who have already been working with post-structuralist, with critical theory, with all that, that there is a highly critical tone in there. Um, but still it's worth taking this also into consideration and we already had that presentation, if you remember, of critical theory of international political economy and many of these ideas pr uh, presented there also can be seen in what I just said. One particular response in political economy that acknowledges the weight of the postmodern view and yet retains an understanding of their social totality. That is quite interesting. It starts with the understanding of social totality found in the work of Adam Smith and Karl Marx, as opposed to that of classical structuralists like the socialists, uh, sociologists uh, Durkheim and Talcott Parsons, or philosophical structuralists that, such as Louis Althusser. Smith and Marx differed fundamentally but agreed on the need to reject the essentialist view that all is redu reducible to the social whole, all analysis to what Durkheim called the social fact. The historicity, the recognition of the contingent nature of social life ruled out such essentialist thinking. 
that making use of the social totality does not require essentialism or reductionism of thought. In fact, as Marx and his 20th century interpreters like Gramsci and Lukács remind us, dialectical thinking leads us to recognize the reality that reality is comprised of both the parts and the whole organized in the concrete totality of integration and contradiction that constitute social life. The third aspect we are now approaching is the one of social philosophy. Social or moral philosophy, to be more precise, provides therefore a third characteristic of a political economy approach. And this is maybe an approach which is not entirely um, opening to some of you in the first moment. So we are used to talking about politics and economics from a very clear-cut point of view, but now we open up our minds for the philosophical approach. The goal of this particular form of analysis is to clarify and make explicit the moral position of economic and political economic perspectives, particularly because moral viewpoints are often masked in these perspectives. When Jeffrey Sachs, a leading architect of economic reconstruction in the former communist world, was asked about his work in the region, he began by calling it the greatest moral challenge of our time. When his colleague Benjamin Friedman wrote a book back in 1988 attacking the excess of Ronald Reagan's presidency, he introduced each chapter with a biblical citation. In their overview of the political economy of communication, Golding and Murdoch in 1991 maintain that what distinguishes critical political economy is that perhaps most importantly of all, that's how they write it, it goes beyond technical issues of sufficiency to engage with basic moral questions of justice, equity, and nothing less than the public good. These are more examples from across the spectrum of perspective in economics and political economy that suggest some unease with what has become the customary practice of separating science from morality. Their interest in moral philosophy reflects a central concern of some of the founding figures in political economy as well. That might be less surprising. Adam Smith, who was not a professor of economics, by the way, but he was a professor of moral philosophy. The author of The Wealth of Nations was a professor of moral philosophy offers a vision of how to advance the social good. It is not, as he would later argue, in the wealth of nations, through selfish behavior or self-interest, but by doing good in a society. It's worth reading it as in his own words. And hence, it is that to feel much for others and little for ourselves, that to restrain our selfish and to indulge our benevolent affections constitutes the perfection of human nature and can alone produce among mankind that harmony of sentiments and passions and which constitutes their whole grace and propriety. Similarly, the already also cited Thomas Malthus, son of a preacher, warns of the moral consequences of unjust population and Karl Marx offers a political economy that would create a society based on satisfying human needs, not one founded on class power. However one responds to their specific visions and values, it is hard to deny that visions and values were central to their analysis that the moral sphere was integral to their work on economics. As the noted political economist Joe and Robinson maintained, it would be left for later, left for later analysis to take this branch of ethics and turn it into a discipline that is striving to be a science.
Robinson said that already back in 1962. There are two central points in this plea for moral philosophy. First, the moral, cultural or spiritual domain is itself the central subject of analysis. Adam Smith chose to write the theory of moral sentiments before his analysis of the division of labor in the marketplace because it was essential to understand the moral basis of a commercial society on the rise in Britain in the last half of the 18th century. He felt that it was a better work than the wealth of nations and returned it to near the end of his life because, according to Lux, there was a more serious problem with unmoderated commercial motives than he was aware of earlier. Similarly, Marx began with moral philosophical treatises that are too readily dismissed as the writings of the young Marx, but which form the core of understanding the values of a growing industrial society. These people then were moral visionaries in another sense. They felt that an essential element of their responsibility as social philosophers was identifying visions of a morally appropriate way of life. For them, the moral vision became the feature that distinguished reason from rationality. This can be a difficult point to understand because Western culture, particularly Western culture, has tended to separate science from morality. One voice speaks the language of rationality, logic and positivism, that one of science, the other, a normative language that is generally permitted to talk back but not with the other. One is customarily permitted to go only so far as Max Weber, who felt that it was acceptable to be motivated by moral concerns but that the canons of science left no room for morality in analysis. The defense of the standpoint is that moral concerns get in the way of the objectivity essential for scientific achievement and ultimately prevent science from developing the means to address the very problems that moralists arise, erase. Defenders of moral philosophy respond by pointing to the many problems from climate change to world poverty that an unreflective science has helped to create. One of the central breaks in the transition from political economy to economics was the acceptance of the Weberian view that value neutrality defined the limits of the relationship between economics and moral philosophy. Economics could study values also, in practice, this meant identifying values with preferences registered by marketplace choices. Moral comment was hold little or no explicit place in the economist's explanation of ass or assessment. Some would contend that the separation of moral philosophy from economist meant simply that the form went underground only to insinuate itself into economists' assumptions and choices of ideas, concepts and variables. Maybe we need an example here. The decision to define human labor along with land and capital as merely a factor of production, so we talked about that word of human resources, just as a resource, not as an individual with feelings, with rights, with a dignity. That type of classification may very well make analytic sense, but it also reflects a certain moral vision, however implicit, that people are interchangeable with things or that lives are interchangeable with capital. And maybe in this we can find a reason for many of the problems, of many of the difficulties and the bad situations we currently face can be found in. The economist argues that such a view is limited to the economic domain and reflects economic practice. Critics respond that visions spill over into other areas of social life so that workers viewed as tools for the economist's research purpose 
come to be seen more widely as mere tools and are often treated accordingly in the real life. By naturalizing specific economic practices that reduce living labor to a factor of production, economics slip a moral vision through the back door. So, without, in other words, even if you do not speak outspokenly about particular implications of philosophical nature, by also leaving them away, you portray and you support a particular philosophical vision and maybe by leaving away uh, an outright philosophical vision you support a very problematic one instead. The debate over the separation of fact and value, analysis and prescription, economics and moral philosophy continues, but there are signs of change in the wind. Nevertheless, it is chiefly the heterodox schools of thought rooted in political economy that take up the moral concern. The conservative wing of public choice or constitutional political economy seeks to extend the tools of economic analysis to moral choice and aims to use economics to establish Brennan and Buchanan's civic religion. Let us now come to the fourth and last characteristic um, of political economy, the political economy approach, and that is praxis. What is praxis? Praxis is an idea with deep roots in the history of philosophy again, and one which has found several paths to communication studies in particular, including, including Marxian theory, the Frankfurt School of Critical Thought, and the action research tradition best embodied in sociology. Most generally, praxis refers to human activity and specifically to the free and creative activity by which people produce and change the world, including changing themselves. The word originates, as so many others we've been talking about, in the ancient Greek, where it typically referred to the political and business activities of free men. It reached some prominence in the work of Aristotle, who considered economic, political and ethical studies as forms of practical knowledge to be distinguished from theory and poesis. Where theory thought truth and poesis the production of something, the goal of praxis was action. The term played a major role in debates about the division of knowledge in medieval and early modern thought. Praxis came to occupy a central place in the work of the philosophers Kant, Hegel and Marx. For Kant, praxis or practical reason takes primacy in the unity with theory that comprises full reason. Indeed, morality is defined as the absolutely practical. Hegel also recognized the superi superiority of praxis to theory, but looked to a higher unity for truth to be found in freedom, where the absolute spirit realizes itself in philosophy, the arts and religion. Marx was concerned with praxis from his earliest work, a doctoral dissertation he did on Greek philosophy, which insisted that philosophy be made practical. His principal interest in the term was to create an alternative to alienated labor. In Marx's view, capitalism freed labor from the alienation of necessity only to replace it with a new form of alienation, the reduction of labor power to a marketable commodity. The revolutionary goal was to transform alienated labor into praxis of free universal self-activity. Gramsci and Lukács made use of praxis to attack the more deterministic forms of Marxism contained in Kapital and in Engels' retrading of Marx. The term entered debates in communication theory through the work of the Frankfurt School and particularly that of Marcuse and Habermas who added weight to praxis by defining it as a general form of action 
of which labor was one type. Traditionally, labor occupied a central place in economic thought because human history has been forced to live in the realm of necessity that requires human labor. As the productive forces develop and offer the first historical opportunity to overcome necessity, Frankfurt School theorists turn to other forms of praxis to envision what was to constitute the realm of freedom. In his critique of Marx, Habermas in 1973 argued for the distinction between work or purpose of rational action and interaction or communicative action. Marx was understandably taken by the first because labor was central to the transformations brought about by capitalism. For Habermas, however, social praxis was made up of both work and communicative action. The latter, based on consensual norms and constitutive symbols, offered an alternative model of social life, provided that it could be freed from the distortions that restrict, sorry, that restrict democratic open communication. Praxis, and that is where we meet again our core topic, political economy. Praxis is important to both the epistemological and the substantive premises of political economy. In brief, praxis guides a theory of knowledge to view knowing as the ongoing product of theory and practice. It rejects as a partial those epistemologies which conclude that truth can only result from contemplation. Knowledge requires more than a process of honing and purifying conceptual thought. Rather, it grows out of the mutual constitution of conception and execution, like a hand-in-hand -hand of theory, of thinking, of contemplation, and the real world out there, the realm of practical action, of praxis. Praxis has also occupied an important place in the substantive development of political economy. After all, political economy began as the practical activity of household management and control of the polis. Aristotle placed it among the political disciplines whose wisdom would guide the conduct of rulers. There is a notable tension in classical political economy between the desirable the desire to understand the sources of wealth and productivity and the need to advise elites on the appropriate labor, trade and social welfare politics. Now, this is really important. The desire to understand the sources of wealth and productivity and the need to advise elites on the appropriate labor, trade and social welfare policies. Just think about where we can find this tension today in our current world, in our current systems. Those schooled in the Marxian tradition explicitly united the role of political economist and activist in, for example, Gramsci's conception of the organic intellectual. Writing from prison, where he was incarcerated for opposition to Italian fascism, Gramsci provided a model of the intellectual schooled in both the theoretical tools of analysis and in the common sense of practical political struggle. The tension continues in a far different part of the intellectual universe where contemporary mainstream economists struggle over the drives to purify economics with mathematical rigor and to market their advice to businesses and governments. This is not to suggest that the problems posed by praxis are identical for the wide range of thinking that encompasses political economy and economics. More importantly, however, hard one might try, it is impossible to escape the problems that praxis poses for the scholar who would work in the field. Specifically, political economy is inextricably bound to policy studies and the political economy of communication, for example, needs to address both the strength and the pitfalls the relationship creates. For today, this shall be enough. I hope I could give you an insight into the notion, the development, the philosophical and historic foundations of political economy now Together with the presentations you gave, we have seen um, 
schools of thought and theories in political economy, in international political economy. And now we have seen many of its foundations. And on these foundations we now developed for our class, in the next session we will go further in understanding international political economy. Thank you very much for your attention. Have a great day. Bye-bye.